bid trends. Uh, in short, uh, many of our numbers continue to improve, at least when you look at it from the statewide level. There are some regions of the state that are more worrisome than others, particularly the Lake Charles region uh, with respect to cases and hospitalizations and the prevalence there, uh, the higher prevalence there than elsewhere, at least as far as we know, of the UK variant. But I am encouraged by sustained decreases in hospitalizations across the state uh, and also uh, with the increase uh, in vaccinations. Although I can tell you uh, we still have quite a ways to go uh, with respect to the vaccinations. Uh, we believe that a majority of our particularly vulnerable residents are now protected through vaccination. And as of this week, yesterday, as you know, everyone 16 or older is eligible to receive their shot in order to protect themselves and their families. Um, again, the 16 and 17 year olds, they're only authorized uh, Pfizer because its emergency use authorizations went down to age 16. The Moderna and the Johnson & Johnson vaccines are for those who are 18 and older. But everyone who is authorized by the UA, EUA, covered by the EUA, is now eligible in Louisiana. And I think I saw a slide out of LDH that said, if you're worried about who's eligible now, it's all y'all. Didn't y'all put that out? So all y'all are eligible and I'm speaking to the people of Louisiana, uh, obviously those 16 and older. Today, uh, for our COVID numbers, we are adding 499 new cases on 11,866 new tests. Unfortunately, we're also adding 10 new deaths. And the death total uh, since the start of the pandemic is 10,132. 363 people are hospitalized across the state. That's up one yesterday. We're basically had flattened out um, in that range. And 61 of those individuals are on mechanical ventilators. That's down one from yesterday. Um, to put the 363 into some more perspective, and that's the number of people currently in the hospital. On March the 28th of last year, we announced 336. Uh, the next, so this is the lowest number since March the 28th of 2020. In light of these mostly positive trends, uh, today we will be easing the majority of, of current restrictions relative to occupancy levels and, and so forth. Uh, and we'll do that in the proclamation um, that we're gonna issue tomorrow. As you know, the current proclamation ends tomorrow. Uh, I will say at the outset that we are gonna keep the mask mandate in place uh, for this next proclamation period, which will extend 28 days till April the 28th. Uh, when I met with the folks from LDH, and when we look at the CDC guidance, the one thing that they are uh, that they stress the most about where we are in this pandemic is the need to continue uh, to mask as we ramp up these vaccinations. At this point in the pandemic, uh, you know, the three best tools that we have to win the race, which means slow the spread and, and speed the vaccinations, are obviously for people to be vaccinated, uh, for people to wear masks and people to distance. So that's where we're gonna be focused on going forward. Um, again, I've heard the concerns from the CDC about case counts across the country. Uh, we currently have more than 20 states that are heading in the wrong direction in terms of uh, case counts and hospitalizations and I believe positivity. And you're gonna see in a, in a few moments that we have some regions of the state that we're particularly concerned about too, especially as it relates to, to variants which are both more contagious uh, and more virulent. The, uh, the mask mandate, again, remains uh, in place. 
Uh, limitations on when bars and restaurants uh, can serve alcohol will default to local ordinances. So those uh, hours of operation and hours of service uh, restrictions are going to be completely lifted. Specific ca capacity limitations for uh, certain venues are going to be lifted, but um, with the requirement that, that people wear the mask uh, and that engage in the six feet of distancing, uh, that will continue. Uh, but restaurants, bars, gyms, retail settings will no longer have in place a, a strict occupancy limit. Um, so, you know, if you go to a bar, for example, uh, you'll still be required to sit uh, at a table. And that's one of the ways that we can lift restrictions but be relatively confident uh, that, that we're not going to be unnecessarily and unreasonably uh, contributing to the, to the spread of the virus. Businesses and venues that host larger gatherings like reception halls will remain capped at 50% of their capacity, but the maximum now will be uh, 500 people. So it's 50% or 500 people. Um, that, that per person cap is twice what it uh, is in the current proclamation. Outdoors, uh, social distancing uh, will be required, but there is no cap. And I want to just pause here for a moment and remind everyone that any activity outdoors is safer than that same, that same activity indoors. And the weather is improving. Um, it, it's, it's nice out in spring more often than not. The temperatures are nice. The full humidity of summer hadn't hit us yet. Uh, so I'm going to encourage people uh, to have as many of their activities uh, outside as possible. Uh, sporting events will be limited to 50% uh, of their capacity, again, with social distancing. And if I didn't say it already, masking will still be required under all circumstances, except when people are actively uh, eating or drinking. Today marks a big step forward. Uh, but we're all going to have a role to play and do have a role to play in making sure that cases don't spike again. So, so three words, mass, distance, vaccinate. Uh, and be vaccinated as soon as you can get an appointment which, with whichever vaccine uh, is being administered at that location. They're all safe and they're all effective. This is how we're going to put this pandemic behind us. It's how we're going to be able to take off our masks, uh, get back to more normal, uh, but it depends on getting shots in people's arms. Doses sitting on the shelf don't help us end the pandemic or in the freezer. You know, they don't help us end the pandemic. It's doses in arms. This morning, I participated in a call with the White House uh, and other governors. Uh, and the good news is we are anticipating next week a substantial increase in our weekly allocations of doses. And that increase uh, is most, uh, well, it, it's across all of them, the Pfizer, the Moderna, and, and the Johnson & Johnson. Uh, and we don't have our specific allocations for next week, um, but and, and that, at least that's my understanding. They'll come out a little later today, and then on Thursday we'll start ordering. But based on the increases that they told us are going into effect nationwide for next week, we believe that we will have more than 300,000 first doses allocated to Louisiana next week. That does not include the retail pharmacy program. It does not include the uh, federally qualified health centers that are directly participating in a federal program. It doesn't improve the direct federal uh, vaccination efforts at the VA and the Bureau of Prisons and, and uh, Indian Affairs and, and so forth. And so what, I, what I'm trying to tell the people of Louisiana is the month of April is going to be critical to our success. Uh, we are going to have more doses than we've had at any point up to now, and it's within our collective ability to make tremendous progress against this pandemic. In order to further this effort, I'm excited to announce that as part of our Bring Back Louisiana campaign, 
We are also standing up a vaccine hotline. Uh, existing contact tracing workforce members will be cross-trained to respond to this new stage of our COVID response. It's a smart solution. It is timely and it comes at no additional cost. The hotline will be able to schedule residents for vaccine appointments tied to our pilots uh, and all LEH vaccine events. Uh, it will help navigate the larger system of vaccine providers and locations and connect residents to a medical professional for any questions that they might want to ask about the vaccines. This is a big deal. Our campaign is all about meeting people where they are, breaking barriers so that everyone has the opportunity to get the vaccines. Uh, this hotline addresses at least two specific barriers. One, the lack of access to internet, uh, tech savviness or the time and ability to navigate our network of providers and events to schedule a vaccine. And two, lack of access to a medical professional to answer specific medical questions. LDH will train 60 call agents, 10 specifically for clinical support. And that'll happen this week. Uh, we know that many eligible Louisianans have jobs that make it tough to schedule appointments, get their questions answered, and get the vaccine during the day. So this hotline will also help address that barrier with its hours of operation. The hotline will be up and running next week, and we're going to share more information later, including the phone number and hours of operation. In the meantime, if you're looking to schedule an appointment, uh, Please don't double book. We know that that's happening um, across the state. I've spoke with medical uh, officers from hospitals all across the state of Louisiana last week, and they said they've seen a number of people who are making multiple appointments, and then they're going to the one that works best for them. And they either then cancel the other ones or they just don't show up. But what those cancellations and, and no-shows do is it prevents other Louisianans from being able to access that appointment and get that dose uh, of vaccine as soon as they should be able to do so. So it's, it's really causing some problems uh, for uh, the entire uh, vaccine program. So we're asking people to just make one appointment for a vaccination. Uh, otherwise, it's extremely difficult for providers to know how many vaccines to prepare, how many to take out of the freezer and so forth. And then again, it makes it more difficult for fellow Louisianans to schedule uh, their appointments and it delays their vaccinations unnecessarily. And nobody should delay their vaccinations. Uh, you know, I, I happen to know of people who contracted COVID just a few days before they were scheduled to be vaccinated, or maybe they, they put off being vaccinated and they contracted uh, COVID. So this is a race against time and we're asking everyone to be good neighbors. Uh, if you have an appointment scheduled, uh, you've got a shot, uh, just keep that appointment, but don't hog multiple appointment times. In addition to getting the vaccine, wearing a mask and proper hand washing, I also wanna take this opportunity to remind everyone uh, you should still do what you need to do to be your healthiest. Uh, so please uh, take care of your wellness checkups, including important health screenings. I recently uh, did this myself. Uh, it was reported this week that now more than 100,000 women have received breast cancer screening because of Medicaid expansion alone. Uh, these are women who may not have had health coverage, but for uh, the expansion in our state. Uh, nearly 50, uh, I'm sorry, nearly 60,000 adults have received colon cancer screening and about 18,400 of, of them averted cancer. Uh, over 466,000 Louisiana adults have received preventative health care or new patient service uh, since July 1st of 2016. And it's something we all need to do so that we're at our healthiest, uh, which is important all the time, uh, but is especially important during a pandemic. And also, if you're gonna get a checkup, you have an opportunity to interact with a medical provider and ask questions, if you have questions, about the vaccines. So please take advantage of, of that opportunity. With that, I'm gonna ask Dr. Canner to come up. He's gonna go through some information with you and then I will return. Um, as usual, please ask questions of Dr. Canner while he's here. 
and then I'll come and wrap up and, and take questions of my own. Thank you all. Good afternoon. Thank you, Governor. Thank you for your leadership. And um, I'd like to just uh, begin by um, emphasizing what, what the governor said a few minutes ago, which is, as of yesterday, everyone 16 years and older in Louisiana is eligible to get vaccinated. So all y'all are eligible, and we got to avail ourselves of that opportunity without question. Um, the, um, I'm going to run over quickly the epidemiologic trends uh, that we've been looking at. We look at these numbers um, routinely, and then we do a, a hard stop uh, every time one of the governor's proclamations is set to expire to uh, you know, review where we're at and, and, and see what would be prudent going forward. So um, what you see on the slide there is the typical uh, gating criteria numbers that we look at. I'm going to walk people through really quickly what we're looking at. So on the top left, you see COVID-like illness. COVID-like illness is a measure of the percent of people presenting to emergency departments with COVID-like symptoms. So just a snapshot of what we're seeing in the emergency departments as a measure. It's analogous to how we measure flu um, every year. As you can see, really since the turn of the new year, since January 1st, COVID-like illness in the emergency departments has been downtrending rather steadily, and that is encouraging. On the top right, you'll see new case incidents. So this is the number of new cases uh, or positive new cases of COVID. So it, that means a positive test and deduplicated. So, so no one had it before. We run it through a deduplication de process, um, average over the population and smooth on a seven day rolling average. And you can see that for the past, uh, I can, we counted out 70, 77 days, the state has been declining the number of new cases of COVID diagnosed day in and day out. On the bottom left, you'll see a combination graph. The line on the top of that, the purple line, is testing volume, so the number of tests that are being conducted per capita in the state. And the orange bars on the bottom are percent positivity, the percent of all those tests being conducted that are positive. We are at 2.8% right now, which is a number we've held flat for about a couple weeks right now. That's significantly down, as you can see, from where we were about a month or two prior. And uh, possibly the most important measure here, the one that is the most closely related to mortality or people dying, is on the bottom right, which is hospitalizations. And we have made tremendous improvements in the state in the number of hospitalized COVID patients throughout the state. I'll remind people that during the surge, the most recent surge, um, the Christmas and New Year's surge, we, we surpassed 2,000. We are now down to 363, which is tremendous progress. And um, I think if you talk to people that work in hospitals, they will tell you that it feels, feels much different, a lot less COVID in there, and that is, um, that's a very thankful thing. You go to the next slide, please. And uh, this is when we scale out the state as a whole on the top line and then each of our nine public health regions, we rank it across our three categories, COVID-like illness, cases, and hospitalizations. This is how the graph looked a month ago, the last time we took a, a hard look at this, this data. I'm going to flip forward to how it looks right now and walk folks through here. So you'll see that as the state, we are downtrending or decreasing in COVID-like illness, we're decreasing in new cases, and we're decreasing in hospitalizations. Now, as the governor mentioned, when you look beyond that, more granular into some of the regions, it's not universal downtrending, and we're keeping a very close eye on this, and, and, and some of the regions, particularly Region 5, are giving us, um, giving us concern. So when you dig in a little bit closer, you can see that regions 4, 5, 7, 8, and 9 are all plateauing in COVID-like illness, and regions two, four, and five are plateauing in cases, and region six is increasing in cases, and regions four, five, and six are increasing in hospitalizations. Um, by and large, for most of these, not, not large increases, but, but, but little variations that we're very attentive um, to keeping a close watch on. 
again, on the whole, I think the state has made tremendous progress. No question, I think we've come down from the surge, the increasing rate of vaccinations has certainly helped in that. And I've been encouraged, as a lot of us have, with how far we have come since we began this year. It's been encouraging. One thing I wanna show, and go to the next slide, please, is um, what's happening in nursing homes. And this is one of the most encouraging pieces of data that, that, that we have seen in the state. The blue line there on the top is the number of new cases diagnosed amongst nursing home residents in the state of Louisiana week on week. And what you'll see on that now is that we are at uh, a new historic low since we began counting this closely over a year ago. This past week, we identified or diagnosed 14 new cases of COVID amongst nursing home residents, and that is the lowest number to date since we started following this closely in the pandemic. The reason for that is very simple. It's because we now have 80%, 80, 80% coverage, vaccination coverage amongst nursing home residents. If anyone had questions about the power of these vaccines, what they can do both to an individual to prevent them from getting sick, but in a population to prevent COVID from spreading, that's the graph right there to look at. Look at that blue line and how it's, how it's gone down in the setting of 80% coverage amongst nursing home residents and this is in a difficult to control setting. Remember, COVID can spread very quickly in nursing homes. It's a congregate setting and it's filled with very vulnerable individuals. And with that 80% coverage, we have made just tremendous, tremendous progress. We can do that for the rest of the state. That can easily be a model of what we can do for the rest of the state. And over the next weeks to months, we will have the doses available to us to do that. That is not a question. That slide gives me a lot of encouragement. It tells me not only that what we're doing is right, that we're protecting the very most vulnerable people in the state, but what is possible for the rest of us in the weeks ahead. I do wanna give an update on the variants. This does um, give me um, a lot of concern and, and we're paying very close attention to it. So of the B117 or the, the UK variant, we now have 183. Uh, confirmed or presumptive cases in Louisiana. As we've said the past few weeks, this is very much a tip of the iceberg scenario because we don't do a whole lot of genomic sequencing in the US. So when you have 183 known, you have many, many more that you just haven't been able to sequence and identify. The lion's share of those, 103 of those 183 cases have been diagnosed in the greater Lake Charles area. And we do believe that is why the Lake Charles area is experiencing some increases in cases right now. The CDC will say that as a whole, on average, <clears throat> the percent of all COVID circulating in Louisiana of that 3.5% is this variant. That is lower than some of our neighbors. Florida is at 13.2%, Texas is at 7.1%. And Dr. Fauci estimates that across the country, the number could be as high as 20%. Um, so we're a little bit better off than that, but these things can change very quickly. Just as last week, we're thankful we do not have any identified cases of the B1351 variant. That's the South African variant. It has been identified in 30 states this week with the addition of Alabama, which is a new addition. Texas, Mississippi, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Tennessee have that variant as well. Likewise, we have not identified any cases of the P1 or Brazilian variant. <laughs> excuse me, has been identified in 22 states, closest to us continue to be Texas, Oklahoma, Florida, Georgia, and now Tennessee. One of the things that concerns me and the reason why I'm so attentive to getting vaccine out there quickly and continuing to reduce transmission is that the more transmission you have, the more opportunity for mutations the virus has and the potential for new variants to emerge increases. Right now, this B117 variant is a good match for the vaccine. It's a good match for the vaccine and that's an opportunity for us. We've got to continue to capitalize on that opportunity. I can tell you the vaccine rollout continues to go, to go very well. And I got really assuring reports just last night of um, Jefferson Parish and the Oshner's vaccine fest. That was 24 hours. Uh, they hit somewhere between four and 5,000 
individuals. Um, extraordinarily re reassuring. I think there's going to be more of those throughout the state. At this point in time, 25.7% of the state's population has at least initiated the vaccine series, 15.9% have completed the vaccine series, and 69% of Louisianans 65 years of age and older have initiated the vaccine series. Those are encouraging numbers for us. Nationwide, there's been 147 million doses of vaccine administered. So for folks that want to see what the experience is like in other people, for folks that um, are trying to collect all information out there and, and, and see what it looks like to them, taking a step back and, and looking at that, 147 million doses administered across the country is a, is a real strong marker. And there have not been any concerning safety trends or adverse events pop out. And that's a very, very large number, 147 million people. Um, there are two studies that have came out in the past week that I wanted to mention because they're, they're pretty important studies. The first, this past week, the CDC reported one of the first real world studies on vaccine efficacy in the US population. And they looked at 4,000 first responders, healthcare workers, and other individuals. They followed them through and after vaccination, and then they tested them weekly after they finished vaccination. And remember, we consider being fully vaccinated 14 days after you get your last, your last dose. Now, the trials, as we know for the vaccines, were great, 95, 94%, those type of numbers. You always wonder, what does it look like in the real world when you're not doing a trial, when life happens, when you might not get the second dose exactly on time, all of these things complicated. That's what this recent CDC study looked like. And under the real world conditions, 90% reduction in both symptomatic and asymptomatic COVID in people who completed their vaccine series. And this followed people for four months total. It, the study began four months ago. This is the most reassuring data to date that these vaccines can, are, and will be effective in the real world conditions here in the US and Louisiana. The other study that I found important this past week was a study in the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology that looked specifically at women who were pregnant and women who were breastfeeding infants who received the vaccine. Again, this is a, a body that a, a lot of work is being into and there's a number of studies ongoing and every day more and more data accumulates to show that the vaccine is, is not only safe in pregnant women and breastfeeding women, that it actually has significant benefit beyond that. And this study is the biggest one to date. So what it showed, number one, is that the vaccine is just as safe in pregnant and breastfeeding women as it was in women who are not pregnant or not breastfeeding. Number two, it showed the vaccine was just as effective in those women for their own protection, just as likely to induce the creation of protective antibodies in those women as it is for women who are not pregnant and not breastfeeding. Number three, it showed that those protective antibodies were transmitted through the placenta to the unborn child in pregnant women, meaning that when pregnant women get vaccinated, they pass protection on to the unborn child. And number four, it also showed that those protective antibodies were transmitted through breast milk to breastfeeding infants. So when pregnant women or newly delivered women get vaccinated, they also confer that protection to the infant if they're breastfeeding. Those are very encouraging measures, and there's gonna be more data about pregnant and breastfeeding women to come. Looking ahead to next week, as the governor mentioned, we do not yet have the precise number of doses that the feds are gonna to allocate to us. We typically find that out on Tuesday evenings, and then it gets confirmed sometime on Thursday. But um, after, list after being briefed out by the White House a couple hours ago, we expect a dramatic increase of doses, somewhere in the neighborhood of 300,000 first doses coming to Louisiana next week. That's gonna be a significant increase from what we've been receiving. And I'll remind people this past week, we had another significant increase, 148,000 new first doses, plus the federal pharmacy allocation, which is what enabled us to open it up to everyone 16 years of age and older. The federal retail pharmacy program continues to be a high volume vaccination avenue. 
The feds so far for Louisiana have allocated a total of 358,110 doses to that program, and the Brookshire's pharmacy chain will now be added to that as well, in addition to a couple small independent pharmacies. So this program is gonna to continue to grow, and the feds are looking at this program every day to move more and more volume, and it's, it's worked well for Louisiana. Um, I'm taking a step back, um, you know, we, we, we certainly have some things that we need to keep our eye on ahead, particularly the variants, and what's happening in the Lake Charles area, um, and then the Easter holiday coming ahead as well. We have the tools to keep COVID at bay, and the governor mentioned them. It's masking, it's distancing, it's preferentially spending time outdoors, and it's getting vaccinated. We have the tools at our disposal. With Easter coming, I'd like to remind folks, number one, get vaccinated and get your families vaccinated too. Um, I'll tell you that the governor had mentioned this. I, I, folks will know that I, I work as an ER doc. I had the opportunity to practice clinically this past weekend, and we saw less COVID than, than we had in, in weeks past. No question about that, but still saw a little COVID, and I treated a, a very sick individual with COVID who got admitted to the ICU, who she had the opportunity to get vaccinated a few weeks prior and, 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 and decided to wait. How terrible would it be if one of your loved ones got sick with COVID and had the opportunity to get vaccinated ahead of that? How terrible would that be? Um, remember to keep Easter celebrations um, safe. Remember that um, if everyone in the private gathering is fully vaccinated, you can take off the masks and you can not distance. And if you're gathering with one other household who is unvaccinated, um, and no one in there is high risk for complications, you can also take the mask off and, and not distance. And it's much safer to do those gatherings outdoors. And I took a look at the weather and most part of the state on Easter Sunday is gonna be 73 degrees, partly sunny. So why not, why not do it outdoors? Um, and just remember, I'll say it one more time, everyone now 16 years of age, of age, in Louisiana is eligible for the vaccine. If you've already gotten it, I, I thank you. If you have not yet, if you have already gotten it, I'm gonna ask you, become an ambassador, talk to your friends and family, talk to them on what your experience was, and try and get your friends and family vaccinated too. It's gonna to make a difference. Be happy to answer any questions if there are any. Yes, sir. Testing decrease, um, looking at the numbers, seemingly a, a significant uh, drop from January to where our numbers are right now. Um, are you confident that we're getting a, a, a pretty accurate picture of, of what COVID looks like in this state and that that positivity rate is actually what it is? Yeah, I, it's, it's a very good and very, very fair question. And you're right, the testing volume has decreased. We took a hit. I'm testing volume late February during the winter storms, and that recovered, but then it's, it's been trending down a little bit, and there's a couple reasons for that. Number one, testing volume tends to go down as cases go down, because more cases beget more testing, there's more contacts, the more reason to be tested. And a lot of you know institutions are, are understandably putting their attention towards vaccination. Um, the things that give me assurance that we're getting an accurate picture is the percent positivity has stayed relatively flat. When your testing volume goes down and your percent positivity shoots up, that tells you that you're not testing enough. That tells you that there are cases out there that you're not catching. When you keep your percent positivity relatively flat or, or even decrease it as we did a couple weeks ago, it's a pretty good bar that you're still doing enough testing to get a representative sample. The other thing that gives me reassurance more than that is the hospitalizations. You know, there, there is no way to mask or fake or, or, or obscure the number of people that, that get sick. It's a representation of how many people are getting COVID. When more people get COVID, there's more people in, in the hospitals. When less people get COVID, there are less people in the hospitals. And that number, that 363 today, gives me a lot of assurance on that. Add one more. Mm -hmm. yeah. As far as contact tracing goes, uh, you know, these were 
big keys that, that we've talked about at the beginning of the pandemic. Are we still seeing active participation and contact tracing and, and, and are we able to, to still measure how wide, you know, how many, uh, how widespread, you know, someone's contact is if, if they have, uh, if they do test positive? Yeah, we are. The, you know, the, the system is going pretty well and one of the things that I like the most about it is it's not just about contact tracing, it's an opportunity for information dissemination. It's an opportunity to talk to someone about, you know, it's, it's really an opportunity for counseling. And that's what we call them, contact tracers, but they're really more like counselors. They talk to individuals about what it means to be positive, what you should do, what you shouldn't do, what you should say to your friends and family. And they actually connect people with resources if they need it. So that program's going well. As you would imagine, as the incidence, as the number of cases go down, the number of contact tracing encounters goes down as well. And that's one of the things we're actually able to use some of that apparatus that we stood up to gear up for the COVID vaccine hotline that the governor promoted because we have a little bit more of room on those, on those teams. Yes, sir. Dr. Cantor, when you see like uh, sort of some trends nationally and stuff like that and some people nationally sort of saying, you know, a little doom and gloom like kind of the CDC director last night, um, I know she said that, how does Louisiana fare compared to the rest of the country and how do we keep going and doing so good that we're doing right now? Again, a very good and, and fair question. And on the White House call today, Dr. Walensky, the CDC director, noted that over the past week, you know, cases nationally have gone up 13%. And that's really focused in the Northeast, some parts of the Midwest as, as well. The Southern states somewhat remarkably have done pretty well. I wonder if some of that is weather related and we've been able to be outdoors much more over this past month than our neighbors up north um, have been able to. It does give me pause because COVID has a way of not respecting boundaries, you're not respecting state boundaries. You know, as we've done at every step of the way, we have to let the data drive these decisions. And when numbers are going in the right direction and things are going well, it's an opportunity to relax regulations. But if numbers were to go in the other direction, as we've done every step of the way, you know, the state has to respond appropriately. I don't think that that dynamic changes. The larger question of at, at what point you get enough vaccine coverage to prevent against a spike, you know, that really is an unanswered question. I mean, it, it almost is, you know, it's, it's being determined in real time. I'm not inclined to wait and see <laughs> what that answer might be. I mean, we, we have an opportunity to really protect now, and regardless of what that number might be, I'm not inclined to leave that to chance, which, which is why I feel so um, urgent in uh, push to get vaccines out there. Because if there's one major, major tool we have to safeguard against the chance for a spike, and again, you know, states in the Northeast are maybe beginning a spike right now, it's tough to say. If there's one major, major chance we have to prevent against that, it's getting vaccinated. Yep, last question. Dr. Kanner, a clarification and then a question. Um, with this new order, does anything change as it relates to live music from the previous order, or is that all stay the same? Um, the, as I understand it, the uh, live music will be allowed under guidelines from the Open Safely document, the State Fire Marshal's document. Those are going to get tweaked a, a little bit to make it a little bit easier um, for some venues, but the general framework that live music will be allowed with participants seated and with some mitigated measures to prevent the spread of aerosols is gonna stay. Um, and then my actual question is, um, they announced it earlier this week and it's coming later this week, but uh, New York's gonna be the first state with a vaccine passport app that's mm -hmm. tied with venues, entertainment venues, sporting venues. We'll have data about vaccinations testing wise. Um, is the state, Louisiana, considering that? Have there been discussions on a vaccine passport? And regardless of what that answer is, why? It's certainly been discussed. I know it's been discussed nationally. I think it's too soon to really say definitively one way or the other. Um, the federal government has kind of said that they are going to support these type of apps almost on the back end with some tech, but they're going to you know, leave a lot of it to states and or really to the private industry. I, I think, I think it, it's very likely that some businesses might find it a, a, a useful tool to assure the safety. And you can imagine at some point in the future that you might be able to do larger occupancy if that was in place, but I think it's going to be driven by businesses and entities. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Kanner. And uh, just to follow up on a couple of things, um, there is no doubt that testing volume has decreased. I think we reached an all-time high in January, uh, but we're over 500,000 tests in the month of, Mar in the month of March. Uh, to put that in perspective, we were at the end of June of last year getting to 500,000. And when the White House Coronavirus Task Force set a goal for us, it was admittedly a minimum goal in order to see uh, what's really happening in our state, they said you need to be at least 200,000. So we're going to be, you know, we're still testing robustly enough to have a really good indication of what's happening out there. Um, but I think Dr. Kenner's other points are really important. You also look at the percent positivity because sick people are going to get tested. And so the fewer you, your tests, that, that, that symptomatic group's already built into that. And so if you're, if you're testing enough and, and, and the, uh, and I'm sorry, if testing goes down but percent positivity doesn't go up, you can feel good about that. And then the hospitalizations, that's ground truth. Hospitalizations and deaths are ground, ground truth as to where you are. Uh, with respect to live music, I do want to refer people to the Open Safely guidance. Uh, but it will be a little easier uh, for these venues to satisfy that guidance going forward uh, because we found that the limiting factor before were the HVAC systems. Uh, and so now with the distance and other mitigation measures between the performers and, and the crowd, the spectators, uh, the, the HVAC won't be uh, a necessary component of that. Uh, and so, but look at the open safely guidance, but it's going to be easier for venues to satisfy that guidance, guidance and actually have uh, live entertainment. Uh, before I, I take questions, I um, want to transition away from COVID for a moment and talk about DSNAP. This is related to the winter storm, which has been a long time, but it was actually just last month. Uh, and it has been approved for 23 parishes. So get ready, we're going to go through those parishes in just a moment. Um, the, the storms occurred again last month. The application process will run in two phases between Monday, April the 5th and Saturday, April the 17th, and will follow an alphabet schedule according to applicants' last names. And the approved parishes are as follows, Avoyles, Bienville, Bossier, Caddo, Calcasieu, Catahoula, Claiborne, Concordia, DeSoto, East Baton Rouge, Franklin, Grant, LaSalle, Madison, Natchitoches, Washita, Rapides, Red River, Richland, Sabine, Webster, West Carroll, and Wynn. Residents who receive DSNAP benefits in February of, two, of 2021 are not eligible uh, for DSNAP. Residents who began to receive SNAP benefits after 2021 may be, I'm sorry, after February 2021 may be eligible. Finally, um, this is the last press conference before that we had planned at least before the Easter weekend. Um, and for many of us, this will be the first Easter and perhaps the first holiday when because we have taken the opportunity to be vaccinated and so have our family members that we may be able to spend uh, that time with family um, indoors uh, in a safe environment. And Dr. Kanner went over that again. Um, and obviously last winter, uh, it was a different situation with respect to our churches. Uh, so I wanna encourage everyone, uh, as you prepare for Easter, please continue to be mindful that while we're doing much better, there is still reason for concern. We are not out of the woods yet, and everyone should take uh, the proper precautions in order to keep themselves and their loved ones safe. And as difficult as the past year has been, we all have a lot to be thankful for. Um, and so we have a, a big reason to want to get together and, and, and celebrate and, and share with one another. Uh, we just don't want to share COVID. It's still out there. There's still people getting uh, the, the disease every day. 
and they're going into the hospital every day. And unfortunately, as you know too well, people are still dying every day. Um, outside gatherings and small groups are always be always best. Um, and if members of your family are not fully vaccinated, clearly uh, precautions need to be taken. And, and I'm taking some time to go through this because I just want to remind people what it was like uh, when we went through Easter and New Year's. Those holidays, because of the related travel, the gatherings, the activities, caused the largest spike to date. Uh, and we don't want a repeat of that. Not when we're so close to having the opportunity for everyone who is 16 and older to be vaccinated and to protect themselves from this disease. So I'm praying that this season of new birth will be one of blessings and happiness to everyone. Um, and I am confident that 2021 uh, will certainly be better than 2020, but how much better and how soon depends upon each and every one of us. So have a wonderful, safe, and happy Easter, and I will take your questions. Yes, sir. Um, thank you, Governor. Uh, Dr. Walensky yesterday said that she felt impending doom of a fourth surge, yeah. um, and following that, President Biden you know, uh, urged governors not to ease restrictions. Um, do you see the actions today as bucking that federal advice? Mm -hmm. And uh, what, do you, what did you make of those comments yesterday? Well, I mean, I, clearly we eased uh, restrictions. Uh, and we did it because we've had a framework for making these decisions since the very beginning. And it's on the gating criteria in combination with the baseline numbers. Uh, and the gating criteria and the baseline numbers are consistent with reducing the restrictions. Uh, and I know what Dr. Walensky was talking about. There's a, been a, over the, the, there's a, a seven day running average of cases. It's up 13% in the last week. Um, there's a, and it's, I think 62,000 in the country. There is a, also a similar average for deaths. Uh, it's up 6% over the last week, and I think that that number is right at 1,000. Um, they, they've seen about 21 states move in the wrong direction. Uh, and clearly, as I mentioned before, we have some parts of our state that are not doing as well as others. Uh, but at the end of the day, we're trying to be consistent, to do what we can, uh, that, that always seeks to strike the right balance between lives on the one hand, livelihoods on the other. Uh, I think we've done that in this case. And I will point out that much like my own experts, like Dr. Kanner uh, and others at LDH, Dr. Wendlinski's most fervent plea is to keep masks on uh, over the next several weeks because it is critically important uh, because we're finally going to have the opportunity to get an awful lot of people vaccinated very quickly if, if only they will choose to take advantage of that opportunity. Uh, and so we're still very much in that race against the virus, against the variants, and, and the mask is a way to, to slow the spread. Even as you bring more people in close contact, w closer contact, I should say, with one another while those vaccinations ramp up. Um, so what we did, I, I believe, is, is uh, prudent. I wouldn't have done it otherwise, but I am mindful um, that, that the, uh, some of the guidance uh, that was put out by the White House and by the CDC uh, would suggest that you don't loosen any restrictions at this point. Uh, I obviously wasn't comfortable with that approach. Yes, sir. Governor, on a different note, um, I understand that uh, Congressman Graves has asked your administration to consider taking a billion dollars from the ARP and dedicating it to Mississippi River Bridge in, in Baton Rouge and a new Calcasieu Bridge. I wonder if you're considering that and if you have anything else to share in terms of how y'all are thinking mm -hmm. about using the ARP funds, given that the rules, you know, change. At, yeah. Well, first of all, we, I did get a letter, and, and uh, Congressman Gray's preference would be for us to go big on infrastructure. Uh, I will tell you my first priority is to replenish the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund, uh, because without that, we're going to cause uh, automatically by operation of law a tax increase on every employer in the state that 
pays into that fund. Come September, when the REC recognizes the fund balance of our UI trust fund that is below a certain amount. Uh, and the severity of the tax increase and surcharge depends on how low that amount is. Well, that amount is exactly zero today. It was $1.1 billion a year ago. Uh, so I believe that that's the first order of priority. Um, and then on top of that, and, and by the way, that's going to be a considerable amount of money to get to the point where those tax increases are not necessary. On top of that, we don't have uh, the rules issued yet by the Treasury. So we don't know how much of that funding we get in the first year as opposed to year two or year three. So making those allocations uh, just isn't possible yet. Uh, but I can tell you I've already started conversations with legislative leadership, including the Speaker and the, the President, but also other members about that funding and, and, and what it is that, that we should be doing with it. Um, I will point out that uh, to the extent, at least I believe, and, and we have to wait and see exactly how um, the Treasurer interprets the legislation. Uh, to the degree that the funding replaces lost revenue compared to the 2019 base year, I think you can use it for infrastructure of the type that Congressman Graves is interested in doing it. Uh, but we don't know exactly how that's to be computed yet. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the money has to be used for COVID-related expenditures, again, replacing the lost revenue, uh, or it can be spent on water projects, sewer projects, or broadband. Um, and so that would potentially be a limiting factor on how much funding is available for infrastructure that is not water, sewer, or broadband. Yes, sir. The latest surveys on vaccine hesitancy mm -hmm. um, show a lack of trust or hesit hesitancy among conservatives or Republicans, um, and even some um, state Republican lawmakers have said they don't trust the vaccine. What do you say to them, and, and what's your message to, to folks who may be watching who fit into that category? Yeah, you know, um, I don't know what they're waiting for. Um, first of all, I believe that the clinical trials were robust. Uh, and I think all the efforts that were made uh, to ensure the safety and efficacy of the three vaccines that have been approved thus far uh, were considerable. Um, and, and I remember going through this day by day, uh, working within the, the Trump White House, uh, and, and most especially Vice President Pence, who, who chaired the Coronavirus Task Force. Um, and, and the effort there by, by that entire team uh, was to make sure that there was confidence in those vaccines if and when the FDA issued the emergency use authorization. Uh, and I, I said even before that happened that I was fully satisfied. Um, so the, I don't know what role uh, one's political ideology plays in this. It doesn't seem to me to make sense um, on any level but particularly for Republicans when this was the number one thing that the Trump administration uh, used uh, as its, uh, to measure its efforts uh, with respect to fighting this pandemic were the very quick way that safe and effective vaccines were produced and tested and, and, and uh, granted authorization. And then the administration of, of the vaccine that came uh, less than a year after the pandemic started. Um, and I, I will note that the president himself, uh, the former president, has been vaccinated, as has the, the vice president. So I, I, I just don't, I don't get it. Uh, but even if they had some issues with the way that it was produced, at this point, we've been administering vaccine uh, in this state since I think December the 12th. He... Dr. Cantor gave you the numbers of the people who have initiated their vaccine series, how many people have completed, and so forth. Um, and what we're seeing is are vaccines that are incredibly safe. I don't know of a more compelling visual demonstration of how efficacious these vaccines are than looking at that nursing home chart. And, and if you could put that back up, uh, where you see that where, where the third vaccine clinic happened uh, as a matter of, of the timeline, uh, and then the very quick 
uh, and precipitous drop in cases where 80% of residents in nursing homes have been fully vaccinated. You get down to 14 cases statewide. Uh, and these are people who by their age are vulnerable to disease. They typically all have a, at least one comorbid health condition that makes them additionally vulnerable. And they live in a congregant setting. This is why so many deaths happened in nursing homes to begin with, right? Because the, this is the most vulnerable population that exists. And yet with an 80% vaccination rate, you see what happens to the cases. I don't know what more anybody would ever need to know that this is a safe and effective vaccine. And we have the opportunity to do that for the entire state if just enough people will avail themselves of the opportunity to be vaccinated. And I quite frankly don't know what folks are waiting for. Uh, it, it, just, it just doesn't make sense to me, but I'm gonna continue to appeal to them to reach out and have a conversation with a trusted source, a physician, somebody, so that if they can articulate a, a question or some basis for hesitancy or, or whatever, that that can be addressed so that that person can protect themselves and others. Uh, because this pandemic only stops when enough people get vaccinated. It doesn't stop before that. And when the pandemic is over, the coronavirus is still going to be with us. COVID-19 is still going to be with us. But those people who are vaccinated are not going to be feeling its effects. So, so it's just important to do, but I, I cannot begin to understand how one's political philosophy interferes with the, the process of deciding to avail oneself of this particular vaccine or any of, of the vaccines. Yes, sir. As the limit sort of uh, easing up a lot, of course, who is going to enforce so, like the social distancing and stuff that like places like this and like bars and stuff like that? Yeah, well, the, the enforcement will be the same way that, that it has been. Uh, it's pretty easy to go into place and see whether the patrons are seated at the table, for example. Uh, and if they're all seated at the table then, and, and wearing their mask when they're not, then they're going to be in compliance. We're not going to be looking for hours. We're not going to be that they're in operation and serving and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, but I will tell you what I said going back to the very first proclamation that I issued. We're not going to enforce our way out of this pandemic. We have 4.6 million people, tens of thousands of businesses, thousands of churches, and so forth. And so we, we are calling on the people of Louisiana to do what works, what we know works. Um, and one of the ways we know these measures works is because if y'all will remember back at the outset of the pandemic, Louisiana was number one in the nation per capita cases for weeks and weeks. The last number I saw, we were 25. And so what that means is after that initial surge, we have done collectively in Louisiana a better job than most states at managing our response to the pandemic and to reducing spread and so forth. Um, and that's happened because of the people of Louisiana. And it's one of the reasons why I'm confident that we're going to continue to collectively do what is necessary. Now, do I wish that we had more compliance? Absolutely. I mean, I know that there are, there are a number of people out there uh, who are not doing what, what they should in order to keep themselves and their families uh, safe and so forth. Um, but at the end of the day, we have an awful lot of people who do take this seriously. And more often than not, they are engaging in, in the right behaviors. And that makes a tremendous difference. Uh, and so, so uh, you know, we will enforce what we need to, but we're, we continue to call upon the people of Louisiana to be responsible and to be good neighbors. Or maybe that was it. Look, um, I really believe that this is our moment this next 30 days is going to be critically important for us. It's going to be critical to our success. 
in terms of putting this pandemic behind us and getting the state to a place where it is extremely unlikely that we will see another surge. I am also convinced that we are not there today, but we have plenty of promise and potential over the next 30 days. There are three safe and effective vaccines. Consider that nursing home information that we just went over. More than 25% of our state has at least started their vaccination series. We believe that there will be well over 300,000 first doses allocated to Louisiana next week. And if you extrapolate that going forward, there will be well over a million doses, first doses, made available to us in the month of April. Every single person 16 and older is eligible. That's everyone contemplated by the emergency use authorizations that have been granted by the FDA to date. There will be ample opportunity for people to be vaccinated in every nook and cranny of the state. And you're gonna have an opportunity to do that during the day, on weekends, at nights. And so this is a critical month as we try to make sure that, that we win this race against time and against the virus and the variants. And there are two overarching priorities. They are masking and they're vaccinating. Let's collectively put forth a tremendous effort in the month of April. Uh, and, and if we do that, I am convinced uh, that we're gonna position ourselves um, just 13 months after the start of the pandemic uh, in a way that, that will really make a meaningful and lasting difference. And everyone have a blessed and holy Easter and please continue to lift up our state in prayer and all those people who are struggling with COVID, the family members of those who've died over the past year and there have been well over 10,000 of those now. And let's be resolved that that number will be as low as we can possibly make it going forward. Thank you all and God bless.